So keep that in mind. Phil, let me let me get in front of a camera. Hello. Hey. So can you can you hear us? Yeah, can you guys hear me? Yes, sir, we hear you great. I may actually turn you down a sec. You're not the first woman to want to shut me up. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, the good news is that almost everybody in the class nailed the question about what is a plank. That's great. Yeah, yeah. So, so we're so we're starting we're starting from you know a high point. So let me do a quick introduction. Uh, Phil Simon is actually one of those great examples of why Twitter rocks. So I'm tweeting about something. He's tweeting about something. We end. I retweet him or he retweets me. Something happens, and we end up in a chat, and then we end up on the phone. It turns out we both went to Carnegie Mellon. We both follow some of the same people have some similar interests. And so, what, about the last year? Yeah, so about for the last year, I actually assigned the age of the platform um, to last year's 524 class. They read the whole book. Now he has coming out a new book. Um, it's going to launch by March? Yes, early March. Yeah, early March, called uh, Too Big to Ignore, um, which is focused on big data. And I've had the pleasure of reading an early draft. We'll be talking about big data later, and I will be referencing his material. He'll talk through that. We may get a little bit of big data out of him tonight. Um, so you want to be thinking about massive data sets. How many of you guys work with big data? OK, so a few. That was about, uh, I don't know, half the class work with big, big data. So those of you who don't, it's about velocity, volume, and variety. So you know, handling unstructured data handling the mass of things like Amazon does. Um, I think that the connections between big data and platforms are kind of interesting and so on. But you guys have had a chance to watch the video where you know Phil did a stand-up talking to the, the library folks. And this is basically Q&A. So this is a flipped class. You've done your homework. You've done your background. And now you get a chance to talk to the author, pull out any other insights, you know, things that have happened past then. All yours. Except, Phil, you're going to do like five minutes, right? Yeah, I just wanted to say thank you, yeah. Terry, for the opportunity. And hello, class. Is it 524? But, by the way, Terry, you said I might talk a little bit about big data. That has such great alliteration. <laughs> yes, it does. We'll have to do that one again. But um, anyway, I'm, I'm hoping that the time we spend class is much more uh, interactive than my rambling. Uh, you read the book. You hopefully didn't hate the book. You have uh, questions or you disagree with parts, um, we'll make it interactive. Um, rather than rehash the whole book, did anyone not hear about the Facebook social graph announcement? Okay, so everybody heard. Yeah, I got a couple hands. You want to you give, give a brief? Um, well, for those of you who didn't know, the traditional index search that makes Google billions of dollars a year is potentially threatened uh, by what they call social search. And it's interesting because I've written about this a little bit since the announcement, but it's not a matter of Google not having the engineering chops to do it, right? Google engineers are some of the smartest in the world. They've got tons of money. What are they missing? The data. The data, exactly. So this is why Google is just a fairly paranoid about something that is in early, early, early beta. And as I write in the book, this is why Google has spent so much time, money, and effort trying to nail social networks, right? There was Orkut, there was Buzz, there was Google, um, what was the other one, um, Wave, all oh, yeah. of which were reasonably successful, but they, they weren't Facebook killers. So this is the kind of paranoia that I think you'll find at the Gang of Four and at other companies like, like Twitter and, and some of the more progressive ones. No one wants to be Microsoft, right? I mean eight, ten years ago, you'd think, well, how could Microsoft's dominance in Windows and Office possibly be questioned, right? Now, you know, Microsoft isn't going anywhere, but it faces a lot of challenges. If you look at that stock over the last decade, it's been essentially flat. So um, does this class talk at all about Christensen's book, The Innovator's Dilemma? We mentioned him a little bit. We talked about disruption. 
uh, to the degree that you know people who are going to disrupt are likely to have something that's worse and that the incumbents won't even be interested in? Okay, right. So rather than poo-poo social networking and social search, one can envision a day in which you don't want to go to Google for the right answer because you trust your friends. And just as an example, and I'm not sure if I write about this in the book or not, I think I do actually. Um, I'm talking to you on my MacBook Pro and I see someone in the front row has a Mac and we see mostly Macs there so you're, you guys get it. Yeah. Um, but when I thought about buying a Mac two and a half years ago that I hadn't touched since I, worked at Carnegie, uh, since I went to Carnegie Mellon, I didn't go to Google and look for the pros and the cons of Macs versus PCs. I asked my friends and within two hours, 14 or so of my friends just said, we know you, you'll love it. That's a search that didn't take place on Google and if you multiply that by billions and billions, then all of a sudden Google's you know, currently sort of unquestioned position as the dominant US search uh, tool with what, 68% of the market, all of a sudden goes away. So. I think you're better off being paranoid than being complacent. Even though this tool that Zuckerberg announced may not go anywhere, the potential, I think, is transformative. So um, that's just one of the things that has happened recently that sort of underscores this notion of platforms uh, and big data. And the new book, as Terry mentioned, sort of fell off from that, right? Aside from building a platform as a business model and encouraging other developers and users to take that platforms in different directions, what else do these companies do really well and the question was, well, man, it's their data exceptionally well, right? And not just the internal stuff, right? We're not talking about Amazon being able to tell you instantly how many customers it has. And we're talking about hundreds of millions. We're talking about managing all, as Terry said, the unstructured stuff, right? The stuff external to the organization, making sense out of a YouTube video. So without any further ado, uh, were there particular parts of the book or there's a particular issue, particular event? Hit me with your best shot. I answered all your questions. What an amazing book I wrote. <laughs> no one has any quads. Uh, come on. Someone disagree with me or something. The, the caffeine needs to hit. Gio, I know you got something. Uh, no, I was just thinking about that, that idea of Facebook and, and the alternative, which is the search, right? Mm -hmm. An open search. So I see it more of a open search or open opinion versus a opinion a closed opinion from my circle of friends. Um, so I can I compare the two and I, I would probably, even though I, you know, I trust my friends, I would like to have, in, a, in addition, I would like to have an independent opinion mm -hmm. by doing a search. Uh, if I compare the two, it seems like, well, you know, maybe Facebook may have some success, but it, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't be taken all from a open search. Yeah, I think that the two very much could be complements rather than, than substitutes, but ultimately when you click through, who gets the credit for that click, right? Right now if you use Google and companies pay a lot of money for AdWords, right? Google makes money because you, you asked your friends where to go for a restaurant or what kind of computer to buy or whatever. Uh, but what happens if people stop using Facebook as a social network and they use it more to buy things, right? I mean, at some point, we're going to see the buy button or the want button, right? Not just the like button. I think it's only a matter of time. So yeah, I agree with you. In 20 years, people will still be doing index searches the same way there are still people using legacy systems that should have been retired two decades ago. But I think the question is a matter of scale. And if Google can't do something that Facebook can, and that thing is actually very popular, could Google's model crumble? It's not going to as happen today or tomorrow, but is anyone, you know, particularly as we use mobile devices, well, what happens when our friends are recommending things to us? And you're right, we may not trust our friends, right? <laughs> I saw a great line on the internet, uh, some blog post that Google knows what we think, Facebook knows what we say. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Well, go go ahead. Yeah, so, isn't it like uh, you know this, you know uh, this? this move from Facebook, doesn't it actually create a war of platforms? So suppose you had Facebook as a platform which was social networking. Google had a platform for searches. Amazon had a platform for buying stuff. So isn't Facebook kind of integrating it, you know, like a statistic thing and then people 
you know, you know, like 20 years down the line, people won't go to Amazon to buy stuff, or people won't go to Google to search for stuff. They just go on Facebook, search stuff, buy stuff, you know, you know, be connected. So doesn't this actually come out to be a war of the platforms then, you know, with the big four platforms that, you know, that Oh, it absolutely is a war. And, and right now, people might think of Facebook as a social network. But as we saw with Amazon in 1995, people thought of Amazon as a bookstore. Now, it, they absolutely sell books. I, I would wager that 70 or 80 percent of my own books are sold on, on Amazon, but Amazon is so much more than a bookstore, right? In the book, I write about AWS with the cloud services. I write about how it's selling hardware. Amazon is becoming a publisher. Tim Ferriss from the 4-Hour Workweek and the 4-Hour Diet now received, I think it was an $800,000 advance from Amazon because if you like Tim Ferriss's stuff, and millions of people do, then does it really matter that it comes from Amazon the publisher as opposed to Penguin? And oh, by the way, in the last 17 years, Amazon's learned a thing or two about publishing. Mm -hmm. So it, you're right. It's I, I agree with you that you know right now Facebook may be seen as a social network, but you know, uh, one of my favorite quotes in, in the book comes from David Kirkpatrick's book, The Facebook Effect, and Zuckerberg at the age of 21. What is he, 28 now? He's so, old. It's really yeah. old. So, uh, but the age of 21, he was saying, I'm not trying to build a popular website. I'm not trying to get rich and sell my company. I'm trying to build a platform. Um, who thinks like that at, at age 21? I mean, that's, that's an astonishing level of, uh, of, of wisdom for somebody that age. So uh, I, I agree with you. It, who's to say that, you know, look, I don't think Facebook will sell more books than Amazon anytime soon. Um, I think that all of the platforms that I talk about in the book, The Game of Four, have their areas of expertise, right? And they're dominant in those areas. Um, it's funny to reflect over the last 17 months or so since the book has come out. Uh, I think it's held up pretty well. Uh, clearly, Samsung has emerged as a threat to Apple, and you're talking to a guy who bought Apple stock at 675 thinking it's going to 1,000. <laughs> and, yeah. um, and it's gone down. And, and companies like Groupon have really struggled. But for the most part, I think the book has held up. Um, if I could write it right now, I'd probably focus on some emerging funding platforms like Kickstarter. Has that been a focus of this course? Um, it's actually Thursday. Okay. No, Tuesday. Today's Thursday. It's Tuesday's topic. Okay. Yeah. Well, I don't want to steal any thunder, but the implications of a company like uh, Kickstarter mm -hmm. are enormous. I mean, I put Kickstarter up there with a company like Kaggle which does these data contests and gamification among the five coolest companies out there because they're part wiki, part social network, part funding platform. Um, they take all these things and they put them in the microwave and they hit cook and people like you come up with these crazy ideas in the new book I discussed NASA and NASA has an 18 billion dollar budget, right? They can afford to spend money on oodles of things but um, in the example in the book I discuss how they outsource to the site Top Coder um, two different data sets of pictures, right? So for those of you who are technical, if you think about data and databases, you, you don't write a query against pictures, right? Say which pictures are in this set that are not in this set, right? It's not orders or employees or sales. Um, they're pictures. It's unstructured data. So NASA throws it out there for $1,000, a woman, maybe 24 years old, in Kiev, Ukraine, came up with a way of, say, of finding out which pictures were missing from this new data set in, in NASA. And $1,000 to NASA is like two cents to you and me, and they could have afforded to spend a lot of money on a consulting firm. So even a company like NASA is using open innovation in platforms. This isn't just something that uh, startups have to use, right? I mean, Amazon, Apple, Facebook, Google, if you combine their market cap, you're probably close to one and a half trillion dollars. Um, but it's interesting to see how, as myself as an example, I have an app in the App Store for my third book, The New Small. Now, that app is in Angry Birds, but if that app blows up, yeah. and I'll cross my fingers that it does, well, then Apple makes 30 cents on the dollar, and I make the other 70%. So just from a risk management perspective, it, it doesn't cost much for them to make the software development kits available, for them to create an open API and let people play with it, and then all of a sudden someone creates a really cool app that gets downloaded. So that's one of the reasons that Apple has $120 billion or whatever in cash. Um, yeah, they sell a lot of iPads and iPods and MacBook Pros, but they're also taking advantage of, are you guys familiar with The Long Tail? Chris Anderson's book? 
Okay. For those of you who don't know, it used to be um, you know, 15, 20 years ago, you'd go into a bookstore, you'd go into a blockbuster, and they'd have the, the top selling movies, right? You would not stock, um, let's say, a book that sells five copies a year or Tower Records. I would never find the albums that I wanted because they were obscure. Well, now on Amazon, they have unlimited shelf space. So these companies understand that even an app that gets downloaded five or ten times or a book that gets bought five or ten times a year, if you add up all of the area under the long tail, that actually amounts to a lot of money. Right. Well, let, let's talk about some wall platforms. You know, you and I were talking about Udemy, and a couple of the students have signed up. I gave them the free coupon code for that negotiation class I put up. Mm -hmm. So you've got Udemy is a completely open platform. You know, once they verify that you're a real person and not some scam artist, anybody can post a class on Udemy. Coursera and Udacity, I think you have to vote, you have to have a university affiliation, and it may have to be the university that has the relationship. So it's a B to not a B to B, but B to edu kind of relationship. The wall. Um, Harvard hasn't gotten into it, which seems kind of nuts to me. You know, lost opportunity. And those guys tend to be pretty <coughs> thoughtful. Harvard Business School Press being the thoughtful piece of it. Harvard Business School Press already has all the faculty going to find materials, not just from Harvard, but from Stanford and all the other schools that have a big case writing capability. Why aren't they also trying to become where I'm going to put a great talk on open innovation? I know a pretty good talk on open innovation. You guys are going to like it. So why aren't they being where I want to go? But there's a hurdle there. So kind of the thought between an open platform versus a platform with hurdles or even walls. Right. And, and, I'll, and I'll add to the mix the fact that there I am reading my sci-fi before I go to sleep. I finish a book. I'm in Kindle on my iPad. What's, what hurdle did I hit? I can't buy the book through the app. I have to go out to Safari and buy it because Apple has erected a wall. Yeah. Right? So walls versus no walls. Right. Any thoughts? I, I do, and a couple things. First of all, I think it's actually Udemy because it's an academy of you. Oh, OK. Instead of Udemy? Right, right. Okay. Although Udemy, Udemy sounds kind of hipper. Um, yeah. <laughs> I do think it's you to me. So that's number one. And second, I don't think of platforms in terms of a binary, right? You're either totally open or you're totally closed. Um, there certainly are much more closed platforms. Uh, back uh, 10 years ago when I was making most of my money not writing books and speaking but doing enterprise consulting, when you went to a company and they had a PeopleSoft or Oracle as the enterprise system, you, you wouldn't go to an app store the same way you do with, say, Salesforce.com which is one of the emerging platforms I write about in the back of the book. Right. Um, you had to build basically an app or a report or some customized form there and then take it and port it over to every different place. So I look at it in terms of a continuum rather than a binary. Um, I'd say that Udemy is pretty open but not totally open. Here's why. Um, if you wanted to create a course for how to start a Ponzi scheme, something tells me that someone at Udemy would go, we, we don't want this there, right? or how to get rid of porn, or whatever. So there are probably limits there. But it's interesting to watch the evolution of certain uh, platforms. For example, with Twitter, they used to be very developer friendly. And a guy by the name of Dalton Caldwell, about six, eight months ago, used another platform, Kickstarter, to found app.net. And with app.net, you have to pay $50. But then it's a completely ad-free platform. It's a social network, but it's developer friendly. Like, Open APIs, developers dream, and I understand why he did it. He was frustrated that, that Twitter was shutting down its its APIs. It was being more restrictive. But think about it. Show of hands. Be honest. Eight years ago, or whenever you joined Facebook, and I'm assuming most of you are on Facebook. If Facebook cost fifty dollars to join, how many of you would have written the check? Probably very few. So yeah, the, got no hands. I did, I did pay the money to the new guys, but. I never okay. go there. Right. So to answer your question <laughs> about, say, education, I, I'd say that uh, a lot of successful institutions like Harvard, which I think has the world's great, uh, largest endowment, maybe even bigger than, than Carnegie, which gets a lot of money, uh, as, as you know, from uh, the Defense Department, yeah. um, it's almost the same as the cable companies, right? Why don't cable companies offer a la carte pricing, right? Why do those of you who still have cable, and, and many of you don't, right, because you've got Vivo and YouTube and Netflix and, and Apple TV, 
Um, why do they make you buy a package when I have? Um, I won't judge people who watch the cooking channel. I, I never do, but I'm basically paying for it. It's because they still can. Yeah. But one can envision a scenario five, ten years down the road in which they're no longer able to do that. So I would think that for the most part, company and, and this is why this is why I think the, the gang of four is really exceptional. They're not changing because they have to. They're changing because the whole Steve Jobs quote, if, if those of you have read the book. My favorite quote from the Isaacson book is that if you don't cannibalize yourself, another company will. So I would argue that it's short-sighted for some of these companies to deny that this change is happening, but whether or not you embrace open platforms or not, it doesn't mean that Harvard is going away. I mean, how much does it cost for, forget uh, grad school, what's that, 60 or 70? I was I was talking about Harvard as a school, but Harvard Business School Press. So Harvard Business School Press does didn't change over to allow not only do they they publish or give you access to Stanford's material, but they also allow me to bypass the bookstore, but don't tell um, to bypass the bookstore here and say here are the two cases. Go buy these two cases. Buy them directly from Harvard. For you know three something a piece instead of however much their you know uptick would be, so they at least let us do that kind of piecemeal thing, and I'm not sure if you guys could just go and buy bits and pieces of cases you wanted to read because you wanted to read them, right? So they've opened up that much, but they seem to still kind of be stuck on what they think they sell, rather than you know letting Uda is it Udacity then or is it? Uh, that, I'm not as familiar with that one, but I would think that for some older established institutions, and, and Harvard was established, what, mid-18th century? Yeah. Did it, yeah. Did it predate the founding of this country? I think it did. Yeah. Right. So to, let's say it's 250 years old. Yeah. There's a lot of tradition there, right? I don't think it's a coincidence that among the gang of four, the only one that wasn't born in the Internet era is Apple. Right, Apple was founded in I think '76 or '77, and it took a transformative leader like Steve Jobs to really salvage the company. So, um, I, I find that the older the institution, whether it's a company or a nonprofit or education, government, the harder they embrace change. When when you guys watch that video from the library people, I had many co side conversations, and I also did a talk uh, at a postal conference. And so many people told me, you're absolutely right, but what you're saying will never happen. Yeah. And it all, it all stems from the fact that people make these decisions, right? Zuckerberg gets it. Um, you know, Steve Jobs obviously got it. Jeff Bezos is a once-in-a-generation leader. Larry and Sergey are, are brilliant. Um, but it, I, I've always said that a culture eats strategy for lunch. Well, and you, and you already raised the innovator's dilemma, right, which would support your point, too. Right. I mean, I don't think Harvard's going anywhere, but some people will say, you know, once you let the genie out of the bottle, you can't put it back in. Yeah. Right. So I can see why these companies are, or these organizations are very conservative at first. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, you don't want to be too open, uh, uh, Terry, to get to your initial question. Um, think about it. Um, Android, I would argue, was, was too open, right? It was the wild, wild west. People were downloading apps. They didn't know if it would work. There were a lot of viruses, and, and people complained. In fact, there was a lawsuit in one case. The company spent a couple million dollars three, four years ago marketing an app that ultimately Apple took a long time to prove it. That's one of those tensions there. A lot of people like a closed platform because they know that what they download will probably be safe. Now, not always. Uh, if you hadn't heard, a company called Path had created an app that violated Apple's terms of service, right? It's EULA, and it was grabbing all the contact information, right. putting it in a text file, sending it to a server, and once Apple found out about that, they cut them off and had, you know, I think the head of the company got a stern talking to from uh, Tim Cook. But it's, it's a tension, and I find it really interesting because there isn't necessarily a right answer. I can't say to people when I do consulting, that the platform needs to be right here, right? But if you're trying to build something from the ground up, it's, as a general rule, better to be more open. But just because you're open doesn't mean that anything's going to happen, right? Uh, RIM could say, our platform's totally open. Go develop on it. Big deal, right? Ha show of hands, who there has a, um, a BlackBerry? Do you have two phones or just the BlackBerry? She has two phones. Okay, so two. I bet you a Coke that five, six years ago, if I asked you, 
who had a BlackBerry, most of you would have raised your hands. So just because the platform is open, and I talk about this in the book, you have to give people the tools, but you have to give people the incentives. RIM went so far as to, I believe it was offer um, thousands of dollars to developers to build apps. <laughs> a lot of times people go, I love the QWERTY keyboard, but the apps suck. That's a problem. Right. Right. Good question. Yeah, so, go for it. Um, I have a question here. Um, we've been, you know, you talk a lot about platforms and the benefit of having a platform as kind of a foundation for the business. But if you take, I mean, and we have excellent examples of that and where it's worked and where it hasn't worked in the tech industry, it's really easy for us to focus on that here, especially in the Valley. But when you look at the broader sense for business in general, uh, content and bits and data makes up a very small percentage of business overall. And how does a platform really apply to all the vast other areas of business, you know, manufacturing, oil and gas, finance, you name it. You take the top 20, 30 companies, very few of those are tech companies. Mm -hmm. Like I think Apple's mm -hmm. the only one that makes it. So uh, do you have any insight or knowledge on this kind of approach being applied to other areas of business? Sure. And uh, where does it work? Does it not work? Is it, is it valued there? A couple of things, and I think it's an interesting question. First of all, I would argue that every company is becoming a tech company, right? And if you look at those top 30 or 40 companies by virtue of market cap, I would be shocked if most of them aren't embracing the digital age. Now, some may go, may go faster than others, but even retailers, right? Wearable technology, the movie Minority Report, right? When you go and you, you know, Tom Cruise is, is, is moving the screens and then the ad says, you know, what, what do you like those jeans you bought? Um, so um, if you think about the Internet of Things and, and where things are going and the amount of data being generated, I think that more and more companies will, figure, will try to figure out how they can use tech to their advantage. But to get to the other part of your question, I completely agree with you. A platform guarantees nothing. You still need to have a product that people want, right? And I think RIM is a great example, right? Not a lot of people want the BlackBerry more. Now, it's a little bit of a chicken and egg question because do I not like it because it doesn't have apps or... Does it not have apps because not a lot of people like it? And are you all familiar with network effects? We haven't talked about it yet, but basically the idea is you know you have to have people have to be there before someone like Twitter has any value, right? Right. So for instance, um, if you go back 15 years ago, and one of you, let's say the the guy, and it looks like the um, yellow shirt, you had a fax machine or you had email, and you were the only one, right? You're an early adopter, congratulations. But it does you nothing because you're the only one with a fax machine, right? You can't fax anything, right? You can't send an email. But as network, you know, networks, network effects are very reflexive. They're popular because they're popular. Does that make sense? And they become exponentially more popular. So you still need to have a product that people want. And I'll be the first in the book. I write about how go ahead and build a black, uh, platform for beepers. No one's buying beepers these days. So I, I agree that a platform is no elixir, no, no panacea. Um, but I do think that if you look at traditional companies, you know, they have to evolve. They have to see um, who can take their product in different directions. And that doesn't mean that the government's going to open up a lot of secure data, a lot of secure information to anybody, lest we have another WikiLeaks. But even if you look at government, and I researched this for the new book, you know, government is finally embracing platform thinking. There's a lot being done with, with open data. A lot of, in the new book I write about uh, the mayor of Boston, Thomas Menino, who launched an app called Street Bump to try to find potholes better, right? right? So historically they've had uh, trucks drive around trying to find them or someone would call it in, hey, on the 7-Eleven on Main Street there's a pothole. Well now with Street Bump, you, you download the app, you volunteer to participate, and if 100 or 500 phones with the same GPS coordinates all of a sudden bump, that's probably not a coincidence. So I think that we're seeing a lot more of this platform thinking throughout. In fact, Tim O'Reilly has been very outspoken about the government uh, needing to embrace platform thinking. But uh, whoever asked the question, I think you're right. It's, it's happening slower in some industries. And if you're dealing with a brick and mortar kind of business, it, it may not happen as quickly as a, a Google or an Amazon. Right. I think the, the woman in the back had a question as well. Oh, let's go Ashley first and then Yeah, I had a question about Kickstarter. Um, I was looking on the website, it says you can't start something for a charity, which I get, you just can't raise money for a 
Indiegogo. Yeah. Yeah. But it's an also for a cause. And that I was kind of wanted to question you about the cause part because most social biz businesses are built because of cause. Right. Business around it, but it's still a cause. So I was kind of wondering where that line draws, and then if it is more of a cause based, you have to see some kind of business plan so that it's not like a pure charity play, and how do you guys deal with that? Yeah, I would think that the reason, without asking specifically, um, has to do with something like the, the taxes or legal reasons. Um, but but you're, there probably are, in fact, with the Jobs Act, I know there are going to be plenty of sites like Kickstarter that maybe have a specific niche. So Kickstarter has actually had a lot of issues because some people have tried to invest and it's not an investment vehicle. Kickstarter isn't actually legally responsible. So if you look at, say, the, have you all heard of the Pebble Watch? I, I have at least one on order, yeah. Okay, exactly, you have it on order. And when did that project close? Six months ago, eight months ago? Oh, a long time. Right. So yeah. think about it. Kickstarter was actually a victim of this network effect. The Wall Street Journal picked it up. The guy from Kickstarter wanted to raise $100,000. Do you know how much Kickstarter raised? Like $11 million. And yeah, they, they capped it. I think it was at $10 million. Um, and, and think about it. That, that's an astonishing number. But just to get back to Amazon for a second, mm -hmm. Kickstarter makes its money by taking 5%. So of that $10 million, Kickstarter made a cool $500,000 for basically putting up a web page. But if you, and Terry knows this, and I've, I've, I've funded two books on Kickstarter. I've, I've, I've sponsored many projects. I've sponsored friends' projects. All of those payments go through Amazon's credit card system because we trust Amazon, right? I may not give my credit card to some guy, right, who started Pebble Watch or to this company Kickstarter, but Amazon I trust. So I think that we're seeing with Kickstarter, um, no one thought that it would be this popular, right? Because if you were a VC, I bet you that Kickstarter at some point reached out for money. People probably said with individual projects or the company, no one's ever going to do this. Oh, now, of course, a lot of people are doing this. So there's this unpredictability right now with platforms. You don't know if an app is going to fall on its face or it's going to be downloaded 300 million times like Angry Birds. Right? You don't know if a service is going to take off, if a plank is going to be successful. You know, Google's had four bites now with the social app. Well, Facebook launched a service and I use that word liberally, uh, called Beacon in 2008 that put people's credit card purchases on their Facebook timeline. So you had wives asking their husbands when they came home, why did you buy a gold bracelet? <laughs> and it was for their mistresses. So there are all sorts of things that we only can recognize in, in hindsight. So to get back to the question from before, so you're saying if I guarantee a platform then my business will be like Amazon, Apple, Facebook, and Google. A absolutely not. Um, there's something to be said for timing and for luck. You know, Facebook wasn't the first social network, but Zuckerberg was smart enough to realize. Does anyone remember Friendster? Yep. Okay. Friendster was an amazing concept, but it was always down. You always had those four or four hours. Why? It was so good, it couldn't support the popularity of it. And Zuckerberg, if you if you uh, watch the movie The Social Network or read um, Fitzpatrick's book. He specifically limited Facebook to only the areas or the colleges at the time that could support it. He knew that if Facebook came so hyped, but it was always down, then you wouldn't come back to it. So there's something to be said for having more scale than you possibly need. And that's why with Kickstarter, I bet you if each one of you launched 10 Kickstarter projects right now, Kickstarter wouldn't go down. That's true. Yes. Actually, you kind of answered part of my question, but um, another one will be um, in, in, in your keynote spe uh, speeches, I think, I, I heard that he mentioned about uh, Google building a lot of pranks on top of its platforms, various products, services, and they're also, I'm thinking about also traditional companies, let's say Southwest, it's a very simple business model, they, they focus on some core business values, and when how, how do you decide on, you know, whether we should develop more products or services on the platform, more core planks, or just stick with our core companies? Well, I'll, I'll complicate your question a little bit, too. So she's asking, um, how do you decide how many planks to create? But I'd also say, how do you decide how open are you to letting other people create planks based on your platform? 
Well, as for the actual number, you, you ask me. Can I tell you? <laughs> um, it, it's much more art than science. I, I mean, if you look at what Google had become when Larry, um, Larry Page took over about a year and a half ago, he said, we're too focused, right? Does anyone remember the Yahoo peanut butter manifesto? Uh, um, the people in my, in my org design class should have read it. OK. Well, long story short, um, it was around 2004, 2005, a senior muckety-muck at Yahoo wrote this memo claiming that Yahoo was spreading itself too thin, right? Hence, peanut butter. And Google actually, Larry Page had thought, had suffered from that, right? They were doing too many things, and some of them really weren't going very well. So they retired iGoogle, which I used to love. They retired, they retired Google Squared, which was a preview of the semantic web. You weren't just getting search results. You were getting a grid that you could sort. It, it's, it's still coming. It just, it's, they retired it. They retired Google Health. So they retired products that they thought didn't have a future. But again, it's much more art than science. Google still does a lot of different things, like Google Glass, the self-driving car. I mean, as for a search engine company, an ad company that still makes 85, 90% of its revenue from ads, to be creating self-driving cars, right? Uh, most of the planks are adjacent. Are adjacent. Yeah, yeah. That's one that isn't quite so. Um, it's much more art than science. Uh, in terms of letting other people build on it, that, that also gets into a tricky area. My favorite story here is, um, has anyone ever heard of a stock twits? Okay, this is a really interesting story. About four or five months ago, um, uh, Twitter launched a cash tag. And instead of hashtag uh, too big to ignore, hashtag age of the platform, whatever, um, you had a stock symbol. So stock symbol AAPL or MSFT or whatever. And you would click on that, and I think you could still do it, and it would bring up financial information. That was a great idea, except it wasn't Twitter's. <laughs> there was a guy who started Stock Twits, and he wrote a scathing blog post in which he just went off and say, this is theft, this is my intellectual property, and I probably would feel the same way if I were, if I were he. However, if you take away the open API, if you take away the data, if you take away Twitter's platform, there's no way this guy would have started it. So there's this fundamental tension and I think that if you look at something like app.net and some of the backlash that Twitter's had to face over the last year or so in closing its platform, mm -hmm. it's this tension, right? You want to let people develop on it, but you don't want the terms to be too onerous. And you have to be really careful if you're Twitter because if you slap the hands of too many developers, then guess what? Developers go someplace else, right? It's not the only microblogging service, although it's the most prominent one. And the promise of being able to build on top of something and get paid right, has to be tempered with the fact that they can just steal your idea. In fact, um, I think it was, um, it might have been the guy from app.net, Dalton Caldwell, who had a meeting with Mark Zuckerberg's folks, and they basically told him, we're going to do what you're doing um, with or without you. These are our terms, take it or leave it. So you have to be really careful that you're not bullying the ecosystem, you're not bullying the partners. Uh, but I can't say that there's a five-point checklist. I, I'd say that you want to be developer friendly, mm -hmm. but at some point you don't want your you don't want to become Android, right? If you're Twitter, you want a standard UI. You don't necessarily want there to be 157 different ones, and people go, "This is too messy." So it is attention. Right. Now I know we had. Uh, were you were you the next one, or was there? Let's go here and then one more. Okay. So my question is about the latest news from Facebook. They created a new plank, the graph search. And uh, as soon as that news came out, there were news about how is it going to affect Google? Is it going to cannibalize Google's search and all? What are your views on that? Your team and wait. Oh. <laughs> I'm going to make you watch the video. OK, I will. We have it on YouTube. Yeah. Uh, this might just be the law student in me, but you were just talking about how uh, you don't want to look at the ecosystem in terms of uh, developers being able to build off of other people's ideas and creativity and all that I keep thinking about is intellectual property and patents and trying to like where you don't want to limit that. You don't want to limit creativity but it just seems that we are constantly moving towards a world that's so much more interconnected, so much more um, innovative that it's inevitable that people are going to keep using each other's ideas and it's going to be much harder to consistently protect intellectual property. The way it is, so 
I don't know if there's an answer to this at all, but I'm just wondering, do you think that intellectual property in general will have to change, I guess, the way that we legally see it in the future if we're going to be looking at like planks and apps and platforms? Right. That's a great question because um, I, I'm not a lawyer, but I'm not the first person to note that these technologies, these platforms, these web services, the, the world, is changing a lot faster than institutions like the courts, like the legal system, like the police, like the government can handle. Right? If I had to be a lawyer, I would love to focus on where my rights as a citizen stop and where a company's rights as an employer begin. Because if you go out and someone tags you in a picture and you had too much to drink, you're an at-will employee, you can be fired. But I'll hold off on that for a second, but I think it's a really interesting point because for that very reason, a company like Netflix, I would argue, can't become a true platform, right? If I take uh, face, um, Netflix data, which I'm talking about movies, I'm talking about TV shows, and mash it up and do something that Fox or Sony or AMC doesn't like, mm -hmm. that's a big problem. So it's not that face, um, Netflix wouldn't like to do some of the things that Google or Amazon or Apple or Facebook are doing, that they would. They're just bound by the fact that it's, it's really not their content. And this gets into a whole issue that we probably don't have time to discuss about data ownership, right? If I post something on Facebook, is it mine, right? I mean, what happened with Instagram? I read a report that in the two weeks after it changed its terms of service, 50% of the people on Instagram quit. Because Instagram said, you're posting it on our, it's not a platform, right? I mean, you can't build something on top of Instagram. But if I post something on Instagram, then we can use that for our own commercials or our own marketing literature or whatever. And a lot of people said, that doesn't seem right. I'll close with this, though. These are businesses, right? I have a hard time with some of Facebook's decisions, but ultimately, it's my decision to be on Facebook. I can use other search engines other than Google. So remember this, um, these are all businesses, these are not government utilities. When people complain that Google is using information to serve up relevant ads, and they say, I can't opt out, I say, sure you can, quit mm -hmm. Google, right? If you look at the Gang of Four, and I mention this in every one of my talks, everyone, for the most part, uses one or more of these when I do these talks, not because they have to, but because they want to. Right? This isn't 2002 and you have to use the Oracle database and you have to use PeopleSoft and you have to use Microsoft Office and Windows. You have to use an IBM server. You all use these products for the most part as consumers and if you don't like it, you can walk away. But I do hope that you enjoyed the book and if you are inclined, I would always appreciate an Amazon review. And if you want, Terry has my contact information at Twitter, I'm at Phil Simon or I just got PhilSimon.com and I'd love for you to um, check me out. Great. Thank you, Phil. Thank you. Guys, I enjoyed it. All right. Good up. Hey, guys.